welcome everybody. Just wanted to ask you a question. Have you ever wondered who wrote the Bible? Or what historians actually know about the people who wrote the various books of the Bible? There's over 40 authors. Well, to me, that kind of stuff is fascinating. When you find out who wrote certain books and why. What were these people like? Today we're looking at uh, the book of James. And there are a few Jameses mentioned in the New Testament. But the James who wrote this book that we're looking at today has an interesting story. I think it's fascinating. We know that he had great faith. But why? After all, scholars note that before, um, before Jesus was crucified, this James didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So what changed that he went from becoming uh, an unbeliever to being so devoted, urging Jesus' followers to have faith, to pray with faith, and to stay solid in the face of persecution or troubling times? Well, it's because he became a believer only after he encountered the risen Jesus. That's when he started following Jesus. You see, all through Jesus' ministry and mission before the crucifixion, this James was unsupportive. He didn't believe in what Jesus was doing at all. But seeing Jesus back from the dead, that changed everything for James. So he started following Jesus with full devotion, becoming a person of intense and sincere prayer. In fact, James was so faithful, not even being swayed with the threat of death, that he kept speaking about Jesus until people threw him off the highest point of the temple roof in Jerusalem. Unfortunately for James, the fall didn't kill him. So as he lay there dying in pain, his tormentors started throwing rocks at him and beating him with clubs until he died. And you know what James did as this was happening? He prayed for his attackers until his last breath. They heard him praying for them. What a man of faith. What a man of prayer. So when this guy has something to say about faith or prayer or anything, I want to pay attention. Let's pray. God, help us to learn from your word today. Help us to follow James' example and stay close to you until the end. Whether we have comfortable lives or we lead difficult lives or if we live somewhere in the middle, bring us closer to you today no matter where we're starting from. In Jesus' name, amen. James started this book today that we're looking at, this letter, this letter to other believers, by these words, by stating, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is important because another interesting thing about James is that he was a half-brother of Jesus. Now you'd think if that's the case, if he's a half-brother of Jesus, why wouldn't he mention that in his introduction? Why not be like, hey everybody, listen up, okay? This is James here, the brother of Jesus, so you better pay attention. Come on, listen to me. I know the dude. I grew up with him. Hey, I know what I'm talking about. At one point, we even shared a bedroom, and we used to wrestle. I'm his brother, man, so listen. But no, James does almost the opposite. He starts by calling himself a servant, using a Greek word for servant that's actually more accurately translated into English as slave. If James wanted to give weight to his words, or his own reputation, why not introduce himself as someone who grew up with Jesus, is related to him, has a close connection, instead of referring to himself as a bond servant or a slave? Because James wanted Jewish people to know that he considered Jesus to be God, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the master. Rather than James saying, hey, I'm Jesus' brother, he is saying, Jesus is my master. That's what important, is important to James, showing that Jesus is God. With that in mind, straight away, James starts instructing followers of Jesus how to live if they're going to follow Jesus. In verse 2, James instructs us, us how to act when we face trials of all kinds. Notice he didn't say, if you face trials, this is how you should act, but when. And what does he say we should do when that happens? Consider it joy. Wait, how do we do that? Joy? That doesn't make any sense, right? Why? Why take on an attitude of joy when we go through tri trials? Well, James says because it produces patience. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Patience. Wait, I get to go through hard times and then I get patience? Is patience even that valuable? Do I want to go through that? Trials just so I can become patient? Well, James was on to something here. Patience must be valuable to God 
because it's part of the fruit of his spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay, so God wants his children, his followers, to be patient. And going through trials can result in us gaining patience. So what is it? What is patience? Sometimes in the Bible, patience is portrayed as a, kind of two sides of a coin here. Uh, as a quality of self-restraint, and other times it's shown as endurance. And it's the second one, endurance, that James is using here. Not as the passive waiting, but an active endurance. Think of the difference this way. Passive waiting allows you to sit quietly in a doctor's waiting room for a long time instead of pacing back and forth or climbing the walls like a child saying, Mommy, I'm bored. Okay? Whereas active endurance is the quality that helps you finish a marathon or a triathlon. Both qualities of patience have their place. But James is saying that going through trials helps you produce an active type of patience that helps you see things through. That's important. That was important 2,000 years ago with what those followers of Jesus were facing, but it's also important for us today. Just look at how impatient our world is. Yet we are called to be different from the world, set apart from it. We live in a world, at least the modern Western world, that expects immediate gains, <clears throat> immediate rewards, immediate fulfillment, instant gratification. What happens when something doesn't go your way? What happens when something doesn't go your way immediately? How patient are you in those times? What about when someone makes fun of you for your faith or discriminates against you for following Jesus? Or what if someone doesn't want to even know you because of your beliefs? They know what you believe. <clears throat> How patient are we in those times? And that's one of the first things to leave us when we're under pressure or something doesn't go our way. Our manners, our kindness, our calmness, our forgiving nature. And this is interesting because in the Bible, patience is usually linked with kindness and mercy. God's patience is usually linked with kindness and mercy. Now, it might sound odd, but think of it this way. If God is a personal God who wants to be known, then he's constantly revealing who he is. So one of the things he wants us to understand about patience is that patience is his nature. It's part of who he is in dealing with us. <clears throat> How many times in your life, just think about it, have you done something stupid or wrong and then realized, wow, God, you are so patient and forgiving. I'm so sorry. You were still loving and gracious to me. Even when I was so out of line, you didn't give me what I deserve. Over and over again, God is patient with us, towards us. And he wants us to be like that. But it's hard for us to be patient when we're in a hurry, when we're stressed, when people or situations are against us. So we probably need to slow down, slow our thoughts down, and take time out to reflect. <clears throat> in fact, it's probably a good idea to start off our day with that perspective before we get in the rush or have people or situations coming against us. That way, later in the day when trials do come our way, we're more likely to remember, oh yeah, God, I need your help today. What do you want me to learn in this moment? What do you want me to do in this moment? How do I get through this? How do I endure? Maybe you've come across this prayer before. I've heard it many years ago, and it's, uh, yeah, it just goes like this. Dear Lord, so far today, I'm doing okay. I haven't gossiped yet or lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy or selfish, not even one time. I'm on top of things. I have not sinned once today. But in a few minutes, I'm going to get out of bed, and then I'm going to need some help. How many of us can relate to that? I know I can. You know, the Greek word for patience literally means to remain under. It gives a picture of someone being under a heavy load and choosing to remain under it, rather than trying to escape from it. And this makes me think of good parents. Good parents are patient. They have to choose to remain in their circumstances rather than drive their car off the next cliff they come to or take their kids to the desert and just leave them there. The good, loving parent realizes this difficult time is only for a season. These sleepless nights or this rebellious phase or immaturity or whatever else your child throws at you, you realize it's for a season and you will still choose to love this child and raise them and discipline them and be there for them. Is it easy? No. 
But are the children worth it? Yes. You see, the ancient Greeks thought of patience as a frame of mind that endures. And why would you endure with something so hard? Unless motivated by love. A love for God, love for people. That's what James was on about here. When trials come our way, the easiest thing to do would be give up. But love for God and knowing his love for you helps you to remain faithful, helps you remain close to him in prayer, depending on him. Look at Jesus' parable in the, uh, of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus tells the story of a farmer who scatters seed and it lands on four different types of soil. And we're just going to look at one of those, the rocky ground. Uh, starting in verse 20, we read, The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word at once and receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. What was Jesus talking about there? When he talks about seed and the word, he's talking about the good news, God's word. Here Jesus is showing that some people will initially say yes to Jesus. But when things get tough, especially if things get tough because of their faith, those people don't have the patience, the endurance to see it through. They don't last. The Apostle Paul also took, uh, spoke about faith, patience, trials, and endurance. In Romans 5, he writes this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So Paul is showing here that because of Christ, we can stand up under trials. We can press forward. We are upheld firmly and safely by the power of God. As God's renewing us and giving us patience from the inside, we have God's spirit. We have his favor. And it's not a fragile temporary favor, but a lasting favor because of what Christ has accomplished for us. And James said, James said that staying faithful in trials brings us patience. Paul also reminds us about staying faithful in prayer through any tri trials that come our way. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says this, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though out, outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Notice how Paul called our troubles light and momentary. Have you ever thought of your troubles as light and momentary? Or do they feel more like heavy and permanent? How can Paul say light and momentary? I mean, look at what he went through. Because he's, he's comparing our human struggles to what's eternal. Whatever trials we're suffering here on earth, they have an end date. The orphan won't always be an orphan. The widow won't always be a widow. The homeless won't always be homeless. The sad, the lonely, the hurting, the prisoner, the addict, the persecuted won't always be sad, lonely, hurting, in prison, addicted, persecuted. Thankfully, God offers to help us now in our current struggles, but he also promises something far better that lasts far longer on the other side of those struggles. When life is going well, we tend to think, ah, heaven can wait. I'm not ready for it yet. Man, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. However, when life is tough or we've just had our emotional guts ripped out or something horrible is going on, we tend to think, I can't wait till heaven. Heaven can't get here soon enough because we want out of that situation as quickly as possible. Patience, endurance, prayer. The older I get, the more I realize my dependency on God, especially since God wants us to be like him, patient as we go through these trials. Think of how patient God is with us, his creation. People neglect him, forget about him, 
blame him, despise him, doubt him, even though he loves them. I've heard it said that God is the most jilted lover of all time. He knows suffering. He knows pain. He knows endurance. And remember, God, just, God doesn't just want us to endure by merely surviving it. He wants us to have joy along the way as well, even in the midst of our trials. That's what James is talking about here. That's what uh, Paul was talking about. Look at this. Uh, Paul wrote these words from prison while he's awaiting his execution. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That sounds very similar to what James is saying. Pray your way through trials. Draw near to God in your strife. Receive joy from being in his presence, no matter the circumstances surrounding you. And we see this in the Old Testament as well, not just the New Testament. Think of the famous Psalm 23. Uh, and when King David said these words, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Notice that David isn't whisked away to safety where there are no more enemies or trouble. No, that stuff is still there. David's safety is in the presence of the Lord. David's peace is in the presence of the Lord. And so is our peace and safety in God's presence, even in life storms, even if life storms are all around us. Maybe you're thinking, okay, that's helpful, but how do I remember this when I'm in the midst of trials? Because maybe you're like me. Maybe your default position in conflict is to, resort, to revert back to an unhealthy pattern learned from your childhood. Uh, for some, it can be worry. You go back to worrying just naturally. For some, it's anxiety. For some, it's defensiveness. Uh, for some, it's passive aggressiveness. And the list goes on. Well, how do we remember to rely on God's provision and his presence instead of just going to our reinforced go-to habits from the past? James encourages us to pray for wisdom. It's helpful to pray for wisdom daily anyways, but especially in these circumstances. In verse 5, James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Wisdom here, how James was meaning it, can be rendered as skill for living, not just knowledge, but godly behavior in difficult situations. Uh, just give you an example of the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Uh, just a silly example. Knowledge is knowing what a shark is, right? Wisdom is not trying to ride it or stick your head in its mouth, <laughs> okay? There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. And just remember James for a second. Knowledge was knowing that speaking about Jesus would get him in trouble. But wisdom, that godly behavior in a difficult situation, was deciding to keep speaking about Jesus anyway so that more people could come to know Jesus. James trusted God with his eternal future so that he could calmly speak about Jesus in the face of persecution, praying for the people that were killing him. Having seen the risen Jesus is why James could do this with confidence. When we experience God in our lives, we can confidently move forward. We can do that as well. As you pray your way through life this week, uh, as you have troubles come your way, problems of whatever kind, um, draw closer to God in all situations. And as you do that, both the good ones and the bad ones, I want you to think of these words from Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verses 19 and 20 say this. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. How does God bear our burdens? Partly by us bringing them to him in prayer. That's what James and Paul are talking about. When we pray, God sustains us. After all, think of Jesus' words from Matthew 11 when he said this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. I think about that often when I'm going through something. I think, God, this is more than I can handle. Your word says uh, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Mine isn't. I'm trading. <laughs> I, I'm going to give it to you. I consciously do that on a regular basis when I'm facing something that's too big for me to handle because I know it's not too big for him to handle. How do we persevere under trial? By staying close to Jesus. How do we do that? By being in, remaining in prayer. That is what James is all about here. Uh, we're going to pray, and I'm just going to pray some words uh, from the Old Testament from Isaiah over you. Let's pray. God, I'd like to pray these words from Isaiah over your people now. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. In Jesus' name. Amen.